guys. Hope you guys are doing well. We're just gonna continue with this good story here by the fire. And yeah. So where is it? So I finished with, it was necessary to prove oneself in battle, Fences began. Summer and hot, the full earth had come to the land like the vampire lover that year, tilling the land and the crops of the tenants. Farmers turning the fields of the castle city of Gilead, white and sterile, in the west and some miles distant and near the borders that were the end of the civilized world fighting had already begun all reports were bad and all of them paled to insignificance before the heat that rested over this place of the center cattle had lolled empty-eyed in the pens of the stockyards pigs grunted lustlessly unmindful of the sows and sex and knives wedded for the coming fall. People whined about taxes and conscriptions, as they always did, but there was an apathy beneath the empty passion play of politics. The center had frayed like a rag rug that had been washed and walked on and shaken and hung and dried. The thread that held the last jewel at the breast of the world was unraveling. Things were not holding together. The earth drew in its breath in the summer of the coming eclipse. The boy idled along the upper corridor of this stone place which was home, sensing these things, not understanding. It was also dangerous and empty, waiting to be filled. It was three years since the hanging of the cook, who had always been able to find snacks for hungry boys. Roland had lengthened and filled out both at shoulder and hip, now dressed only in faded denim pants, 14 years old. He had come to look like the man he would become, lean and lank and quick on his feet. He was still unbedded, but two of the younger slatterns of the West Town merchant had cast eyes on him. He had felt a response and felt it more strongly now. Even in the coolness of the passage, he felt sweat on his body. Ahead were his mother's apartments, and he approached them incuriously, meaning only to pass them and go upward to the roof, where a thin breeze and the pleasure of his hand <laughs> awaited. Okay. He had passed the door when the voice called him. You, boy. It was Martin, the counselor. He was dressed with a suspicious, upsetting casualness. Black whipcord trousers, almost as tight as a leotard, and a white shirt open halfway down his hairless chest. His hair was tousled. The boy looked at him silently. Come in, come in, don't stand in the hall. Your mother wants to speak to you. He was smiling his mouth. <clears throat> he was smiling with his mouth, but the lines on his face held a deeper, more sardonic humor. Beneath that, and in his eyes, there was only coldness. In truth, his mother did not seem to want to see him. She sat in a low-backed chair by the large window in the central parlor of her apartment, the one which overlooked the hot blank stone of the central courtyard. She was dressed in a loose and formal gown and kept slipping from one white shoulder and looked at the boy only once, a quick, glinting, rueful smile like autumn sun on a rill of water. During the interview which followed, she steadied her hands rather than her son. He saw her, her seldom now, and the phantom of a 
and the Phantom of Cradle songs. True Sid Chisid Chasid had almost faded from his brain. But he was be but he was a beloved stranger. He felt an amorphous fear and in an inchoate, inchoate hatred, never heard that one before, for Martin, his father's closest advisor, was born. Are you well, Ro? she asked him softly. Martin stood beside her, a heavy, disturbing hand near the juncture of her white shoulder and white neck, smiling on them both. His brown eyes were dark to the point of blackness and smiling. Yes, he said. Your studies go well? Her name's pleased in court? Her mouth quirked at this second name as if she had tasted something bitter. I'm trying, he said. They both knew he was not flashingly intelligent like Cuthbert or even quick like Jamie. He was a plotter and a bludgeoner. Even Alan was better at studies. And David, she knew his affection for the hawk. The boy looked up at Martin, still smiling fraternally down at on Aldous. Past his prime, his mother seemed to wince. For a moment, Martin's face seemed to darken, his grip on her shoulder to tighten. Then she looked out into the hot whiteness of the day, and all was a, as it had been. It's a charade, he thought, a game. Who is playing with who? You have a cut on your forehead, Martin said, still smiling, and pointed a negligent, negligent finger at the mark of court's latest. Thank you for this in, instructive day. Fashion. Are you going to be a fighter like your father, or, you, or are you just slow? This time, she did wince. Both, the boy said. He looked steadily at Martin and smiled painfully. Even in here, it was very hot. Martin stopped smiling abruptly. You can go to the roof now, boy. I believe you have business there. My mother has not yet dismissed me, bondsman. Martin's face twisted as if the boy had lashed him with a squirt. The boy heard his mother dreadful, woeful gasp. She spoke his name, but the painful smile remained intact on the boy's face as he stepped forward. Will you give me a sign of fealty, bondsman, in the name of my father whom you serve? Martin stared at him rankly and unbelieving. Go, Martin said gently, go and find your hand. Smiling rather horribly, the boy went. As he closed the door and went back to the way he came, he heard his mother wail. It was a banshee sound, and then, unbelievably, the sound of his father's man striking her and telling her to shut her quack, to shut her quack. And then he heard Martin's laugh. The boy continued to smile as he went through his test. <clears throat> Interesting. I'll keep going a little bit. That wasn't that long. All right. Jamie had come from the shops, and when he saw the boy crossing the exercise yard, exercise yard, he ran to tell Roland the latest gossip of bloodshed and revolt to the west. But he fell aside. The words all unspoken. They had known each other since the time of infancy, as boys. They had dared each other, cuffed each other, and made a thousand explorations of the wall within which they had both been birthed. The boy strode past him, staring without seeing, grinning his painful grin. He was walking toward Court's cottage, where the shades were drawn to ward off the savage afternoon heat. Court napped in the afternoon so that he could enjoy the fullest extent of his evening tomcat forays into the mazed and filthy brothels of the lower town. Jamie, in a flash of intuition, knew 
what was to come, and in his fear and ecstasy, he was torn between following Roland and going after the other. Then his hypnotism was broken, and he ran towards the main building, screaming, Cuthbert, Alan, Thomas, his scream sounded puny and thin in the heat. They had known all of them in that intuitive way boys have that Roland would be the first of them to try the line, but this was too soon. The hideous grin on Roland's face galvanized him as no news of wars, revolts, and witchcrafts could have done. This was more than words from a toothless mouth given over a spire fly speck heads of letter. Roland walked to the cottage of his teacher and kicked the door open. It slammed backwards, hit the plain rough plaster of the wall, and rebounded. He had never been inside before. The entrance opened an austere kitchen that was cool and brown, a table, two straight chairs, two gamuts, a faded linoleum floor, tracked in black paths, from the cooler set in the floor to the counter where the knives hung and to the table. Here was the public man's privacy, the faded refuge of a violent midnight carouser who had loved the boys of three generations roughly and made some of them into gunslingers. Court, he kicked the table, sending it across the room and into the counter. The knives from the wall rack fell twinkling fell in twinkling jack straws. There was a thick stirring in the other room, and a half-sleep clearing of the throat. The boy did not enter, knowing it was a sham, knowing that Court had awakened immediately in a cottage's other room and stood with one glittering eye beside the door, waiting to break the intruder's unwary neck. Court, I want you, bondsman. Now he spoke the high speech, and Court swung the door open. He was dressed in thin underwear, shorts, a squat man with bow legs, runnelled with scars from top to toe, thick with twists of muscle. There was a round, bulging belly. The boy knew from experience that it was spring steel. The one good eye glared at him from the bashed and dented hairless head. The boy saluted formally. Teach me no more, bondsman. Today I teach you. You are early, Puller, Court said casually, but he also spoke the high speech. Two years early, at the very best, I should judge. I will ask only once, will you cry off? The boy only smiled, his hideous, painful smile, but Court, who had seen the smile on a score of bloody scarlet skeet fields of honor and dishonor, was answer enough. Perhaps the only answer he would have believed. It's too bad, the teacher said absently. You have been a most promising pupil, the best in two dozen years, I should say. It will be sad to see you broken and set up on a blind path, but the world has moved on. Bad times are on horseback. The boy still did not speak and would have been incapable of any coherent explanation had it been required, but for the first time the awful smile softened a little. Still, there is a line of, there is a line of blood, Court said, revolt and witchcraft to the west or no i am your bondsman boy i recognize your command and bow to it now if never again with all my heart and court who had cuffed him kicked him bled him cursed him made mock of him called him the very eye of syphilis bent to one knee and bowed his head the boy touched the leathery vulnerably flesh of his neck with wonder for his bondsman in love. Court stood slowly, and there might have been pain behind the impassive mask of his green features. This is a waste. 
Cry off, you foolish boy. I break my own, my own oath. Cry off and wait. The boy said nothing. Very well, if you say so, let it be so. Court's voice became dry and businesslike. One hour and the weapon of your choice. You will bring your stick? I always have. How many sticks have been taken from your court? Which was tantamount to asking, how many boys have I entered the square yard beyond the great hall and returned as gunslinger apprentices? No stick will be taken from me today, the court said slowly. I regret it. There is only the once, boy. The penalty for overeagerness is the same as the penalty for unworthiness. Can you not wait? The boy recalled Martin standing over him, the smile and the, and the sound of the blow from behind the closed doors. No. Very well. What weapon do you choose? The boy said nothing. Court smiles showed a jagged ring of teeth. Wise enough to begin in an hour, you realize you will, in all probability, never see your father, your mother, or your car babies again. I know what exile means, Roland said softly. Go now and meditate on your father's face. Much good will it do you. The boy went without looking back. <laughs> All right, well, that's it for today. If you like, please like and subscribe. Uh, if the volume is good, let me know. If you want me to be a little less loud or more loud, let me know. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next one. Peace out.